importance of uh, communication and uh, its effect. So, so greetings to all of you who are joining us. Uh, and now I will, oh, I will hand it over to you, Russ, so you can do your part. Thanks very much. So my, my name is Russ Hodge. I work at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. And um, this is, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a position where my job at the Institute now is to help scientists with their communication skills, both by giving courses like for the PhD students and, and writing and, and presentation skills. And also now something new, which is to work with a group of teachers who want to learn kind of a method and philosophy of doing this. Um, and I think this is really, really important. It's important for individuals and institutes because I, frankly, I think that we've really greatly misunderstood and, and underappreciated the relationship between communication and science. And that's caused all kinds of problems. It causes problems for people on a daily basis in their careers as they have to do all these tasks like writing papers and things. Um, it causes problems when we when we teach students, um, and it also affects our research. And it has taken a long time to kind of understand how this works, what the connection is between between good communication and good research. Um, and I've I've come to the conclusion that it's it's very, very profound and it's essential to do this. And institutes need to get involved in this. So I'm really happy, like I said, that my institute. Um, has supported me in this. What I would like to try to do with you today is um, I'm going to break this, this session into three parts. The first part is I'm going to give you some examples to try to show you sort of what the challenges that we face in, in this area are, um, what the issues are. Um, I, there's a model that I have developed about the problems and the processes that we use when we communicate. And that model was motivated by observing some very specific things that I'll share with you. Um, the second part is I'll kind of show you a process to analyze things and to fix them. And in the third part, we'll go through some examples, um, probably even some from the FCU, uh, which I took the time to dig up and find. Um, my, my field is molecular biology. And so it's always a stretch when I go into physics, but one of the things that I do is I help train all of the ERC people from the Leibniz organization in Germany who go to the European Research Council to get grants. Um, they have to give presentations and they have to provide written material. And I help train them in all different kinds of fields. And I found that the principles that we're gonna talk about today, they hold for all kinds of science. So. This will work the best. What, what we need to do is I need to help you build a sort of structure in your head as we go along. And so everything that I'm talking about, even if it's from biology or another part of science that's not yours, um, there's some connection between it and what you're doing and maybe problems that you've seen or, or issues that have come up. And so you need to actively the whole way along try to establish those connections. And, and feel free to jump in at any time and ask a question. The, the group is small enough that we can certainly handle that. Um, and we have enough time. So let me just kind of reinforce what I just said by showing you I have this manifesto. And this manifesto is, is kind of my mission. And that is um, to say that science and communication are connected in profound ways that we generally misunderstand or at least underestimate. We need a model to understand how communication works and goes wrong to understand this. If we use this model, we can improve the way we communicate and teach science, and um, we can also improve our research. And again, I know that this is a difficult thing to try to demonstrate in this amount of time, but I think, I think we'll try to do it anyway. And finally, um, the result of this is that there's not enough communication in most curricula in schools in the University for Scientists. And that means that right now institutes really need to give them their staff support. And again, it's really good that your institute is doing this and has, has made the effort to have this kind of course because it's a, a certainly a step in the right direction. Okay, so I would like to I would like to start with an example that we're all uh, sort of familiar with. We all know that um, COVID is struck and that there's been all kinds of things that have happened 
uh, with communication and miscommunication of science during that crisis. But this is, this is not the first time that that's happened. And I wanna show you sort of a, a historical example of another time that this happened. And the example has to do with the AIDS crisis. And this was in the early 1980s. And I'm gonna show you first an excerpt for, from a film. Um, there's a, a film has been made of a very interesting book about the AIDS crisis. Um, the book and the film are called And the Band Played On, and I'll provide references uh, to Patricia for all these things later. And um, in the early days of the AIDS crisis, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, they carried out what they called a cluster study to try to figure out how the disease was being transmitted. Because at that time, there were just too few patients and the pattern was only emerging and they hadn't found the virus yet. And so after they did this study, they held a press conference and I'm gonna show you what happened at that press conference because there's a very nice scene in the film that captures it brilliantly. Um, I have to share a different part of the screen now, and that is this one. Uh, I don't think that's the right one. Hold on, hold on. I think that's the wrong one. Just a moment. This one. It's still not the right screen. Hang on. Yes, this one. Okay, right. Okay, so this is a moment in the press conference. And the CDC, the director of the CDC has just gone through the study, this cluster study. And basically a reporter stands up and asks him, um, the, the director of the Centers for Disease Control asks him what the results were. And here's what happened. And this is very literally what happened in the, in the uh, press conference. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what he said because it's interesting to look at as well. So, he said what was found, and if you ask scientists, was the answer accurate in terms of the way that, it, so first of all, let me show the answer again. If you ask them, was this an accurate answer? It is a very accurate answer, okay? But obviously that doesn't necessarily make it a good answer because saying what you found is not saying what you mean. What, what something means. And, and so let's look at this again. I'm just gonna read it one more time, a little bit more slowly. Uh, and it's also interesting. What do you think the next thing that happened in this press conference was? One more thing happened after this. And can anybody guess what it was? I guess they were asking more, more questions or? Well, actually another reporter stood up and asked exactly the same question again. So, which is kind of, so here's the answer. The existence of a cluster study provides evidence for a hypothesis that people in the study are not randomly associated with each other, and the study is a sexual cluster. On the other hand, we don't have enough scientific evidence to say for certain that one person gives it to another person. We have to focus much more research into this area so that we don't prematurely release information that's not validated. On the other hand, we're not holding back any information that might provide important health benefits. Thank you. Okay, so he, he didn't give a better answer later. And then you have to ask yourself, what will happen as a result of this? So again, this was the first press conference about this. And I think, I think there's three things that are probably gonna happen. One is a reporter will go home, will take that answer and just kind of write it, but it'll get it wrong, but it will be wrong. They'll get the story wrong. That happened a lot of times. Um, the second thing that could happen is the reporter will go to, nowadays they'll go to Wikipedia back then that didn't exist. So, um, you know, or they'll, they'll just go, zoom around the internet or, or try to do their own research to try to interpret the answer. Or the third thing that'll happen is they'll have a scientist friend and they'll say, what does this mean? And it's always about what it means. Um, and and in, in all of these cases, uh, the problem is that current gave up control, he gave up control of the message. And that happens so often, um, it happens so often. And it, it leads a lot of people to think that scientists are hiding something. They, they don't want us to know or they're doing dangerous things they don't want us to know about. Um, <clears throat> well, so you, then you ask yourself, okay, well, what's the solution here? And I'm gonna show you one way to solve the problem. Uh, in a minute, but it's 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 actually quite simple. Um, 
And, and all you have to do is not only explain what happened, but explain what something means. But to do that, there's certain kinds of other information that you need to give the audience. Basically, I think, I think the easiest way is just to explain how a, a cluster study is done. And I wrote really quickly one example of how you could do that. Um, he just could have taken a little bit more time. I mean, obviously, we don't want him to say yes or no to the question because, because he can't. That would be inaccurate. But what he can do is just take a little more time and explain, again, what it means. So let's, here's, an, here's another possible answer. We often learn about a disease before we identify the virus or the other agent that causes it. And that, that can be a long process. But in the meantime, it's crucial to learn how it's transmitted to keep it from spreading. Right now, the best approach we have to figuring out disease transmission is called a cluster study. A cluster study works like this. We identify the people who have a disease and we collect information about them. We look at whether they had any type of interaction with each other. Now, we already know a lot about different types of diseases and the routes they use to cause infections. So what we have to do is check whether the, there's a match between one of those routes and the types of interactions between the patients. If a disease is sexually transmitted, the pattern will probably show that a person who's infected previously had sex with someone else who was already infected. If it's transmitted in some other way, then you wouldn't see that type of pattern. It would probably look random. Our new study shows a lot of people who've had GRID, they, that's what they called it then, have had pr prior sexual contact with someone else who had the disease, and they went on to have sex with other people, and some of those people also contracted it. This pattern is statistics, statistically significant. I can't even talk today. So if we had to choose between two assumptions that the disease is striking just random people or it's transmitted by sex, right now we'd have to choose the second. And here's even, and in the press conference, he actually showed this chart and showed the data and yeah. But right now we've only examined a small number of cases. So we can't absolutely say that people with the disease aren't connected in some other way. He gives a few disclaimers. Um, and it's not that much more. It, he, he, he wouldn't have to write this down. He, he would know it in advance. Basically, he's just explaining the concept of, of a cluster study, what it is, how it works, and statistical significance. And I made a joke at the beginning. I said it's elementary because this is so simple to explain that it was even... Okay. Okay, so we have Schrodinger's bird flu, and we have a case where even in a popular TV show, you could see a real easy example of a cluster study, basically. It was a very small one, but if, if TV can do it, then the director of the CDC can do it, I think. Okay, so what's the point? The point is to, to take this a step further. Now, it's not only in medicine and biology that this kind of thing happens. I found on the FCU website the following information about a project. I think this was a press release. Operation of the three L3 HAPLS laser system at 0.5, you can read this yourself. I can't even read it. I can't even read the words. Um, so I thought this was very interesting, uh, but I had, I think if, if I were a reporter at a press conference asking, um, what does this mean? I would have to probably ask a lot of times to ask what it means. Um, I'll just give you a minute to read this. And this is, this is not an exception. This is very typical kind of writing that we find at institutes and sort of press, com press releases and these kinds of things. Now, one thing that you need to ask is, what's the goal? What was the goal of the CDC press conference? What's the goal of putting out something like this? Again, if there's somebody from the field, you can take your time to read this, but I'm, I'm guessing it will probably lead more questions than, than answers. Um, is there anybody here who's, who actually worked on this project or something really close to this project? In the, in the second part, we'll, we'll get around to interrogating you about, about how you think about these things. Okay, anyway, so I can understand this in a certain way. 
I, 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 part of the reason I can understand it is because I have read many, many thousands of these things. And so I kind of know that there are filters and ways of interpreting it you have to stick into place. But, but let's, just, let's just think about this for a minute. Obviously, if you're going to write a press release about medicine or physics or biology, you have to think of who you're writing for. Now, again, at the CDC, if, if he had been talking to scientists, that answer was perfectly fine because anyone who knows how a cluster study works and knows how to read it and understand it will be able to interpret that message correctly. But if he's talking to reporters, then he has to make this extra step and, and the, the goal is, I think, and, and this has been the goal all the time that I've been in science communication, working with scientists, um, is to tell the real story. And, and so I, I want whoever I'm writing for to get a basic understanding of what the scientists actually did, why they did it, and what it means to them. And this, this thing about meaning is going to come up over and over and over again today. Um, and it turns out... <laughs> that you can't communicate well without thinking well about science or anything else. And this is an issue because a lot of times if you have a trainer who comes into your institute and, and wants to teach people something about communication, they bring in, they're not scientists themselves. And so they bring in some kind of activity that they have people do. And the problem with that is that scientists have unique special problems when they have to write about their own work. And, and there's no way, I found there's no way to help them unless you get into their heads and figure out what they're trying to say. And so we need to do a couple of things. The first thing is you have something called the inner laboratory that we're going to talk a lot about today. And we need to explore that. We need to find out what's in there and how it's organized and where things are and what's in there. The second thing we have to do is we have to think about the goals of the communication activity. And as I said, my goals are always, I want whoever I'm talking to, whether it's my grandparents or it's biologists or physicists or other scientists, I want them to get a basic understanding of what I did, why I did it, and what it means. Okay. So then later, we're going to bring those two things together. So all of this is based on a model of how this works. And let me just tell you a little bit about my personal history, why we need a model, and the frustrations of, of this, the whole issue. And that is, so when, when, I, when I started to write about science, I came to a laboratory. I didn't have a scientific background. And the very first thing that happened was I had to start writing press releases. And the other thing that happened was the director of the Institute came to me and he said, um, I want you to help our scientists write better papers and give presentations and stuff because you're an expert in those things. So when I started to do that, I thought, oh, I'm going to help them fix their English because most of them aren't English speakers. And that's what the problem is. It turns out that's not the problem. So I was, I was really surprised and shocked and kind of amazed to find out everything that was going on. And most of it has to do with the fact that, in, and again, in most of these research uh, systems, scientists just aren't trained to do these things struck uh, systematically over the course of their careers. There are some second language issues. So of course I help people with their English, but I was really surprised because I thought that experts should be able to communicate really well about their own work, the things they know very well. And it turns out that sometimes that's the very hardest thing for them to do. So, so you would probably have an easier time writing about somebody else's work than you would your own, unless you've solved certain cognitive problems, I would call them. And, and so when I was reading papers of students and, and all of these things, I saw these very strange problems. Um, it was really hard. For example, in the text that I just showed you about the laser, whatever, it's really hard for me to distinguish the main points from the details in that story. What's important, what's not important? I mean, there's only so much I can learn from a text like that, right? So there's only so much you can expect me to learn. So do I pick out the right things to learn or remember, or do I pick out the wrong things? Um, another thing that happened was people would throw in a piece of information without any context. So in normal conversation, people don't just spout out random facts to you about the universe. They, they always, you, you need those facts or there's a reason for those facts. And in science communication, people apparently don't care about that. It's possible just to have a fact appear at any time about anything without any context. 
Um, another thing that happened is I would kind of be following along and thinking I understood something and then there would be a jump in the logic. I would, somebody would get from point A to point D and I wouldn't have any idea how they got there or why. And the biggest problem of all is choosing the clearest way to express an idea. And this was very confusing to me because, um, because we've been trained very exhaustively to try to write clearly in, in, in America and also in the UK, you get a lot of training in this. So I, I was just puzzled by this. But on the other hand, I had the chance to talk to some really, really interesting people. And that are, uh, I, got, I got the chance to talk to about 15 Nobel Prize winners. And I noticed something strange. And what I noticed was most of them were extremely good at communicating their science and not only to their colleagues, but to anybody. And you can even read this because if you go to the, the, the website for the Nobel Prize, don't do it now, but later, go to the website for the Nobel Prize and you see that when they get their award, they generally give two speeches. One is a plenary speech to scientists, the scientific community, and the other is to the general public, uh, people like the king of, of um, Sweden, who are not scientists usually, at least not from their fields. And, and again, they turned out to be very good at this. So I wondered, is there a connection between these two things? Is, is there a connection between doing really good science and being a really good communicator? And why, and what, what kind of connection could that be? And I kept finding examples of this. So, so I decided to do a scientific study of science communication. And, and what I did was I did a little bit like uh, we do a lot of things in science. And that is, I wanted to see how the system works. And a lot of times it's easy to understand how a system works when it's disrupted, when it's not working. And in genetics, we do that. Uh, we find mutations, like we find this mutation, which is called curly. And if you investigate the function of that gene, you find out that it encodes, it encodes a molecule that's important right at the end of wing development to, to, to maintain the structure. And so if you study the mistake, you can see how it's supposed to work. And I thought, well, maybe we can do the same thing in communication. Maybe, maybe if I look at all these mistakes, I'm seeing, I'm seeing thousands and thousands of weird problems that I don't understand. Maybe I can use that to kind of decode what's going on. And so I did that over many years. And I found out some things that really surprised me, the first, which, which I really did not expect. And, and also I think are kind of surprising as scientists sometimes. The first thing was that experts have problems communicating with each other, and they're really similar to those that occur with non-experts. A lot of times, they're kind of invisible when the experts talk, but they're still there. And, and they're the same types of problems, which was really interesting. The second thing is, the, mo the biggest problems come from the way that the scientist thinks about their work. And what they understand the goal of a communication task to be. So Jim Curran, when he was talking at the CDC about AIDS, it's not, it's not that he couldn't think of this, it's just the way that he was thinking was structured wrong. What he thought he needed to explain about a, about a cluster study, the way that he thinks about a cluster study was pretty complicated. And the goal of explaining that to people. He didn't have a clear idea of what his goal was. And if you look at these problems, then the third thing I found was, it was actually true that there's a logic behind the problems. And that's what we're gonna spend most of our time talking about um, in, this, in this session. We're gonna talk about what that logic is. And, and if you figure it out, then you can improve the communication. You also improve the thinking and you improve the research, all kinds of ways, all kinds of things. Um, another thing is, People have some ideas that are quite common, but false. The first is a lot of people think that the reason you can communicate is to report results from your experiments. And that's part of it, but that's actually usually not the main part of it or why we're doing it. Another thing is the reason non-scientists don't understand research is just that scientists know a lot more facts. And that's also true, but it's not usually the same problem. Uh, it, it's, it's not usually the biggest problem. And the last thing is, is that when experts from the same field talk to each other, they don't have communication problems. I mentioned that before. They do all the time. And, and they're interesting ones. And 
kind of confusing sometimes. So once again, I discovered that you couldn't fix these problems without fixing problems in thinking. And that requires doing two things. You have to, you have to talk about what I'm calling this inner laboratory. I'm gonna talk a lot about that. And you also have to address an issue that I call ghosts. And this concept of ghosts is really important. And the easiest way to show you what I'm talking about is to, to demonstrate it. So I'm going to show you some images. And when I show you these images, we're all going to see the same thing. That's not each of you is not getting a different image, but we'll also see something different. Both of those at the same time. It's Schrodinger's uh, ghosts. Anyway, so when you look at this and I look at this, we see something different. One thing that would be real different is you might not even know what it is, but maybe you do. But we still see something different because we know different things and because we have different ideas and because we have different backgrounds and we focus on different parts of it. And if we don't know what it is, we focus on really different parts of it. Maybe. Here's another one. So a person who knows what this is looks at this really differently than a person who doesn't know what it is. And people who know what it is usually go through this process of figuring it out. And then they also, within a very short time, they start to see it differently. And I'm gonna give you a really simple example now that doesn't come from science even. Again, it's something we will all see the same thing, but we'll all see something different. So here goes. People who don't play chess see something really different than people who do play chess. I can already tell, I can see a couple of your faces and some of you are already trying to figure this out, right? Those of you who do play chess, you, you're automatically, you just zoom on and you think, okay, what's gonna happen next? Who's winning? Can I win this game? It's because that's why we see these images. So I'll make it a little harder for you. I'll just turn it that way. It makes it a little harder to, to figure out. I could also turn it upside down. Upside down is easier. Anyway. The, the reason why we see different things is because some of us are chess players and some of us aren't. And we also see different things because some of us are better players and some of us are really mediocre players like myself. And, and the reason we see different things is, so the difference in what we see is because of this invisible knowledge that we have. And what kind of knowledge is that? Well, if we watch people play a game, then we can kind of figure some of it out. So people who play chess have a mental model of this game and the model describes the pieces, the names of the pieces, the rules by which each one of them moves and then the behavior of the player and the goal of the game. So you know that white goes first then black and white. And it's really interesting because if you didn't know the rules and you were trying to figure out this game, it's, it would be difficult because the thing, the goal of the game never happens. So you're trying to capture the other person's king, but the game always stops right before that happens. So anyway, and but but if you know those things, then you can look at this and you can analyze it. And you can say, okay, is this possible? And then you can figure out kind of problems using it. You can say, okay, what was what was the last thing that happened? And what's the next thing that happened? Uh, what will probably happen next? And, and what, what will the end state be? And, and this is an important metaphor because everything that happens depends on invisible stuff that is not on the board. It depends on what you know. And the same thing happens in science. Everything that, everything that any of those texts means, anything that a paper means, it all depends on invisible stuff that's in what I call this inner laboratory. And it's not in the paper, it's not there on the board. It's, it's here. And it, because it's invisible, I call it ghosts. Ghosts because it, it's really, really important and it's there and it can be very disruptive. So the communication in science is like the game board. 
And the game is actually going on in our heads. Yeah, a little bit of it is happening on the board, but it's actually happening in our heads. And it's there's a lot of psychology in chess. Those of you play know this, um, probably more in poker. Sure. Anyway, okay, so, so we need this concept of ghosts because in, in the talk that Curran gave about AIDS and in the press release about the, about the um, laser, you can understand it, but it all depends on this invisible stuff that's not in the text or that he didn't actually say. He's expecting it to be in your head. And there's all kinds of these things and they're really interesting. And I'm gonna show you some amazing things <laughs> about them. Um, um, so, but, but, so there are all kinds and we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you different kinds, but they can be, of course they can be a fact that you don't know. So for example, I don't know the wavelengths of red light. And that may be important for something. Um, it, it can be, but oftentimes it's more a more sort of concept or a pattern of things. And there's all kinds of other knowledge. And, and again, I call them ghosts because they're not there. You can't see them. They're not in the text directly. Um, they're in our heads, but you have, to, you have to know those things to understand what it means. And this is a real, real important thing in learning science and communicating science. If, if, if you're trying to learn something, to me, this happens every day. I try to read somebody's paper and there's so many mysterious, strange things in there. And it, it can take me years to understand that paper or I can do it very quickly if I know that these things are there and I know how to find them. And, and these differences, these ghosts represent differences in the way that you think and the way that I think. And that's that disrupts communication all the time. And in fact, most of the time when we're communicating about science, yes, we're talking about results. Yes, we're talking about a specific experiment, but what we're more interested in is how that relates to this whole apparatus, to this whole inner laboratory, to the models out there in the field, which I've somehow brought into my head. And so, so it's not just what the facts are, but how they should be interpreted and fit into models. And, and I said before that the difference between communication and experts and with the public are similar because again, what, what happened in the AIDS press conference was yes, he gave us the facts, but that's not really what it was about. It was how they should be interpreted and how they should be fit into models of disease transmission. So it's real important to know that every scientist constructs their own laboratory out of everything you started building it when you were actually born and you've been building it ever since, and it's individual. It's hopefully very similar to that of your colleagues, but it'll never be identical. You've built it out of all kinds of things, and you have an individual version, and everything you read, and everything you hear, and everything you learn, and every experiment you do goes into this and fits into it somehow. Um, that laboratory defines what things mean, but it's not just a lot of facts or a copy of reality. It's not like, a, it's just like our knowledge of chess isn't photographs of specific pieces and a lot of games that you've memorized. It's more, more than that. And, and to show you how deep and profound this is, I'm gonna give you another example now. And that is, we're gonna talk about something that biologists talk about all the time. And that is, we're gonna talk about a molecule, okay? And I have colleagues who've worked with a molecule called beta-catenin for 30 years and probably longer. And they've worked with this molecule. They know this molecule really well. If, if I'd shown them this picture, they could recognize it instantly, but they wouldn't be able to draw it like this. And they serve, so molecules have a structure. This is their structure. There's one on the top, which is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a modular version. And the one on the bottom is a more, is, is a, um, it's more of a sort of electron density version where you can kind of actually see the, the atomic level shape of it. And it also has a sequence, which means it's built of amino acids. And here's the sequence of it. And no biologist that I know can tell me the even the ones who worked on this for 30 years can tell me the sequence of this molecule. And most of them wouldn't be able to draw it very well. So what is it in their head? It's not the sequence and it's not the structure. What is it? Well, it's a concept. 
It's a function. And, and if you listen to the way that people talk, and if you read what they write about this, you can see that they have this incredibly complex thing in their head. And I can even draw it for you. And the reason I can draw it is because when I hear them talk about it, they use this about a different molecule, but pretend it's beta catenin here in orange. So it's the name of DNA, RNA, and protein. It's three different types of molecules. They use the same name because there's a gene that encodes an RNA that is used as the template to build a protein. And so they give the same name to these three things and th that's how they behave. And so I know that they have this structure in their head. They also use it to refer to the same molecule in flies, in mice and humans. So that means that this is linked to a whole network of ideas about evolution, how evolution works. And they also know that every person has a slightly different version of this molecule. So I can chart out in science, when I read what they write, I can see that they're working from a mental map of, of how this what this molecule is, how it behaves, what it does, its function. And that's because they know biochemistry. They know that DNA makes RNA makes proteins and that's why they have the same name. They know that they've evolved from the same ancestors. So that means flies will have one, mice will have one, humans. I can map out the knowledge that that scientist has to have to write correctly about this molecule. And that's interesting because that means that when I read their writing, it helps a lot to know that that's there. And, and actually, um, if I asked a scientist to do this, it would take them a while to, first of all, they'd have to figure out the little software tool, which is very cool. And I will advertise at the end, it's not mine, a, a, a teacher made this. But, but when, you, when you learn something, what's happening is you're building a map like this, or when you read something, you're building a map like this, you're trying to build one anyway. And either you're taking a piece of information like, oh, did you know that worms have a very special form of this? And I have to say, oh, okay, so I have to put that in the map here somewhere. Or you don't know anything about it, like what's a cluster study, and you have to build one or draw one. And, and again, this is very powerful because it means that what scientists write and what they say and what they do with that information we can use that to look through the communication to what's in their brains and what they're actually talking about. And secondly, it doesn't mean anything unless you have this in your brain. This will change in, in, in 20 years and 30 years, people will draw this map a little bit differently. Each person will draw it a little bit differently. And if we have a communication problem, it's often because my map is a little different than your map. And sometimes I don't have a map at all. Like when you were talking about the FCU's big laser project, I don't have, I mean, yes, I've heard of the lasers. Yes, I know some of their uses, but take me any farther than that. And I have to learn everything from that text, plus a lot of guessing. So let's just take a, take a minute and think about this now. I'm gonna show you some, the deeper implications of this, but. But so what I told you at the beginning was that, that when we communicate, we have this thing called an inner laboratory. And I've shown you, I guess, kind of the first picture of what one looks like. And this isn't real. This is just a model of, of what's in your head. But, but when I write a text for students and I expect them to, or when I write a text for, for anyone, the, the meaning of what I'm writing comes from all these relationships that I have in my head. And I'm expecting them to know certain things or I need to help them build this in a certain way so that they can see this. Does, does that make sense? Does anybody have a question about this or a comment about this so far? I'm gonna take a break and drink a little Red Bull here. Uh, the afternoon, my energy kind of... Question or comment so far? Okay, that happens all the time. Um, anybody else have a question so far about this? 
Okay, well then if not, let me show you again. So let's take this a little bit further. And when we find that this, let's start, so we've, we've started to see there's, there are these things called ghosts. I showed you some images in which, and it's really interesting to look at how many different types there are, because a lot of times when there's a problem in communication, it's because one of these things is there and we need to figure out what kind it is. And if you just look at a little, I'm gonna show you a really nasty little text about biology, sorry about that. Um, and I'm gonna just talk you through it and show. So the point is this, this is a piece of science and I believe that I can tell you everything you need to know to understand this text. You may not understand it now, listen, because again, some of you are not biologists, but let me just read it through. Cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule beta catenin. Normally it's bound to a complex that's targeted for destruction. Signaling by wind blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin. That means it can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. Okay, <laughs> to understand this, to understand this, there's, there's specific things that you need to know. And it's, and it's not just a bunch of facts. There are some facts, okay? So you need to know some terms and concepts like produce and degrade, what does that mean? And molecule, okay, interesting. It, what kind of molecule is it? But you need to know the relationships between these things. You need to know a little bit about the geography of the cell. So signaling by wind to the signal, it's helpful to know that that comes from outside of a cell and it docks onto a molecule on the cell surface. And that triggers a, a reaction inside the cell that involves these other molecules. And the end, the end of this process is that beta catenin is supposed to, it gets a signal from outside the cell and then it can enter the nucleus and it can change the behavior of the cell and its chemistry by activating new genes that have, have been quiet until now. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Some of it is words like produce and degrade and complex and, and knowing what those concepts mean to a biologist. Some of it has to do with where things are, the geography of the cell, but also there's a little film going on here. The film is one thing happens, there's a signal, then there's a biochemical response, and then there's a, an activation of genes through this molecule. And if you put all of that film together, that whole film is a concept, it's called a, a transcription factor. Beta catenin is a thing called a transcription factor, which gets the signal and activates target genes. So this whole little story is about one thing. If I just told you beta catenin is a transcription factor, you would know at least half of this, if you know what that means. But, but again, it's real important. And, and it took me forever to figure out that I didn't understand scientists because the scientist was describing something and actually they were watching a film in their head. Or actually they had an image of something in their head. Um, or actually they knew what something was for, but they weren't telling me what it was for or, or why it was important. So, so there are all these kinds of things. And so again, it helps to know, to have seen kind of these things, here's the membrane, here's the outside of the cell, here's the inside of the cell. Here's a bunch of molecules. You have to know that these little bubbles stand for molecules, but this also stands for protein and this stands for protein and this is DNA and gene and oh, this is. So you have to know how to read the picture. And there's lots of pictures that people use in science. You really have to learn how to read them. And the, other, the interesting thing about this is it's all completely fake. I mean, this picture doesn't look at all like reality. The molecules don't really look like that. The cell doesn't really look like that. The sizes of things are all wrong. There's a billion, trillion, hundred million other things in the picture that we've just left out because they would get in the way and we couldn't see what we wanted to see. So this is a style. There's another style. You can, you can do this kind of in an informatics approach. You can do the same thing and then it looks like this, that signal. Oh, well, we only talked about a few things in that text. Thank goodness. I didn't try to explain all of this to you 
the feedback loops, the inhibitors, the, the, the reasons when and why it happens and when it doesn't happen and so on and so on. I left a lot of stuff out, okay? And so you have part of this in your head. You have a part that you need at any given time. And all of these things, these, these terms and concepts or relationships, any of these things, they can disrupt communication. And a lot of times the only way that we know they're there is through communication. And I'm gonna give you a really, really good example of that. Um, so you know a lot of stuff about your apartment in your house. So if I asked you to draw your apartment or house or to, to give us a little tour, you would start talking about it. Maybe, maybe I would say, you know, I'm looking for a place, maybe, and you're if you're moving out, I want to know if that's a good place for me. You know a lot of stuff about your apartment or your house. Um, you, you almost know, you may not know quite as much as an architect knows. So you, th this is an architect's view of a, of a building uh, here in Berlin on our campus. And this has everything in it. And, and again, I think your image of your house in your brain is kind of like that. If you have, have to go look for something, you know, where are your car keys? If, you, if you're looking for your car keys, you think, okay, there's five places where my car keys usually end up. And so I'm going to go, but that's just one thing, you know, where everything is. And, and you have all these different ways of thinking about your place. You know um, where things are, you know where the wires are behind the walls, because if you ever had to drill and hang a picture or whatever, you needed to know that, right? You know where the water is, you know where the plugs are, where you can put your computer. And this is that kind of an architectural drawing of the house, okay? So you, you see the walls, you see the ventilation, you see all of that stuff. Now, <clears throat> my, the point that I'm going to try to make now is just, I'm going to show you there's, there's something that we can find out about how people think that you only find out if you make them draw their house, okay? So I asked my, my sister to draw her house, and this is what she drew. Um, my sister has a nice house. It's in Kansas. I don't know if you know where Kansas is. It's not too important. Um, anyway, it has a nice big living room. It has a kitchen. Uh, the living room, she has her piano because she's a piano teacher. And then there's uh, two bedrooms. There's her bedroom with her husband. And then there's the bedroom where her grandchildren visit. Um, she has twin boys who are her grandchildren or twin boys. And at the time we did this exercise, they were eight years old, okay? And that's important to know because now I'm gonna ask you, this is just a basic floor plan of a house that was drawn by my sister, who is an adult. What do you think the same house looks like to an eight-year-old child? So here's the way, and it's important that these two are identical twins because I have a control group, okay? so so. Here's what the house looks like to one of the boys. And if you compare it to my sister's drawing, you see that a lot of things are, are kind of right. Um, there's the kitchen is here and the living room is there. The same kind of thing is going on there. There's a bedroom here and there's a bedroom here, right? Okay, well, maybe this child is strange somehow. That does still, there's a lot of differences in those houses. Maybe that child is strange. So let's look at what his identical twin brother drew for the same house. Um, this is the identical twin brother. And once again, we'll compare it to my sister's version, where again, you see that things are kind of in the right place. You have the kitchen, the living room, and the bedroom, and the bathroom, and downstairs. I like that. And backyard, massive backyard, PS, massive backyard. Okay, anyway. So if you compare now the two twins' pictures to each other, you see that they're similar somehow, but they're also really different than my sister's adult view of things. And um, you can even tell what the differences are. So there's things that children don't know about space in houses that is kind of surprising. It was surprising to me. I didn't know what was gonna happen when I asked them to do this. I just suspected. And I, there's, I figured out there's two things they don't know about houses. The first is, and, and I, I made a guess about their mental structure about space, which I then did a scientific experiment to test. I'll explain it to you. So the first thing is they don't realize that the wall of this room is the back of the wall of the room next door. 
And so the experiment you can do is ask a child about this age, you know, six, seven, eight years old, to go into the next room and tell them you're going to knock on the wall and they have to guess where the sound is going to come from and they can't do it. It's like they go into the next room and, and the connection is lost. The second thing they don't know about the house is that if you walk around it on the outside, the shape has to fit this shape too. It all has to fit into the outside shape. And this explains something. It explains when, when I was a child, I was wondered whether our house didn't maybe have secret rooms or secret spaces or maybe secret passageways. And, and this explains why a child will think that is because there's all kinds of places where there could be secret spaces, right? So, so again, what I learned was the children have, their, their knowledge is organized very differently than adults. I can guess what the differences in that knowledge are, but the only way to do that is to make them draw or communicate. I mean, and, and other kinds of communication wouldn't work because they can find everything in that house. They can take me there. They can even tell me how to get there. Yeah, you go out, you turn right, you go through the hall, and then it's on your right side. But they still, there's still things. And I would never have guessed that if I hadn't made them draw. And what's the similarity in science? So how does this map over onto science? Well, the first thing is, is again, I can use... I can use communication to study and make hypotheses about a person's mental structure. So if I ask biology students, and I started to do this, I've, I've collected some data on this, they're all supposed to know evolution really well. But if I ask them to define one of the central concepts of evolution, it's all over the place. They all do it differently. And so, so, and there's, there's also a lot of concepts that seem to be sort of classical concepts, but they're undergoing a lot of transition right now because of new data and new ways of thinking about things. And so if you ask them about those things, then um, you find that they, they really have completely different ideas. Sometimes they have different ideas because people in the field are talking about them in different ways, but sometimes it's just because their inner laboratory is very disorganized and there's things that aren't in the right places in there. Okay, so there's another correlate to science and I'm gonna show you another kind of ghost. And that is, if you look at this, you see something. And the, this is an MRI scan of a person's head, okay? And uh, it's obtained using this magnetic resonance imaging method that involves um, magnet, a huge magnet and radio waves and the same concept as in an MR, if you know. And um, when you look at this, you see something, but what do you see? Do you see the thing? Again, do you see the thing or do you see what's here? And the problem with this kind of black and white image is that when I look at this, I see all kinds of structure and the reason I see that structure is not because I've looked at lots of MRI images, but because I've looked at things like this. So I've, I've seen lots of black, white images. Some of them look fuzzy, some of them look sharp. And when I see an image like this, my brain says, I know what that is. I know what that is, that's a structure. And if it's white, it probably belongs to the same structure. If it's gray, it probably belongs to another structure. So what my brain is doing automatically when I see this image is I'm translating it, I'm seeing things. I'm grouping things, I'm classifying things, I'm categorizing things. But actually there's a lot more data in this image. It's just that I don't know how to look at a grayscale in an MRI scan. So let's see what information is really there with a very simple trick using Photoshop and grayscale conversions. And let's try to find more information that I don't typically see. And if you do that, you get an image like this on the right side. So all I did was I said, imagine that I can't see all the scales of gray that are necessary to really understand this image. And if I do that, I get an image on the right side. So there's a ghost in that when I look at grayscale images, my brain is interpreting things. I'm gonna give you one more example of this before we take a little break. And that is um, another ghost is, Look at this. 
And I gave students the task of just going into the kitchen, finding an object and describing something without naming it. And they couldn't tell what its function was. So they simply had to describe it purely physically. Okay. Now I want you to imagine how you would do that now. Imagine what you would say about this if the job was to get somebody who couldn't see it to draw it correctly. What would you say about it? And how would you, how would you try to help them draw that? Now, when we did this exercise, the people, they did a great job. They gave really good descriptions. And half of the people in the group drew it. And you could tell that somewhere while they were listening, they figured out what the thing was, okay? And they drew it and you could, you could first of all, it matched the description. And it also looked enough like this to recover its function, so to speak, or in its name. They could even name it at the end. Half the students did, but the other half drew something else. And so if, if you thought about how you would describe this, okay, the other half of the students drew this, one of these. And you could see how these, these two are not the same, right? They have different names. These are called beaters in English, and this is a whisker or something like that, egg whisker, something. And you, you could see why people might get confused because, because they're structurally very similar and they're functionally also very similar, which is interesting. But my question to you is, was your description, would you have given a good enough description? And, and it would be easy to describe this in a way that people would not draw this. But only if you realize that this is also there. Only if you think about it, people might get confused by this. So, so again, think about it. If, if you thought of that when you described this, if you realize, okay, there's several things in the kitchen that are kind of similar and I need to be careful because people might draw the wrong thing, then you describe it differently than if you don't realize that that's a problem. Okay, so what would that mean if we translate that example back into science again? Well, a lot of times in biology, we have things like immune cells and um, we talk about what they do and what they're like and what their functions are and how they stop a disease and how they, the role they play in cancer. And then suddenly we discover, we get a new machine and we discover there's an entirely new type of immune cell that we used to think was one type. And now we realize that they are actually two different types. And what that means is we have to go back and we have to look at each of these examples and think about it again and redefine it in a way. And usually that doesn't happen. Usually this kind of is, we're kind of stuck with this. So, so again, this is a ghost that you only, I only found, I only figured out that this happened and that the, this was a problem because I made students do this exercise. And then I discovered something really interesting about the way they think. Um, let's go back to, let's think about the concept of something like a virus or a vaccine. And so <laughs> you'd be amazed how many people don't realize that, you know, you take antibiotics only against bacteria and not against viruses. And if you go to the doctor with what looks like the flu or something virus caused, you better not let him give you antibiotics because that's causing huge problems in the world right now. But it's simply because people know that viruses and bacteria are bad, but they don't have them mapped well enough to, to understand the consequences of that. Um, and there are all kinds of things like this that happened, obviously, during the COVID thing and when people are trying to figure out whether they should get vaccinated or not. Um, a lot of it, it's, it's not that they're lacking information, it's how that information is organized and, and the ghosts that are in those kinds of conversations, they come up all the time and cause all kinds of problems. Okay, so I, let's take just a little break now. Uh, let's take a five minute break. 
And when we come back, we'll take this to the next level. And I'll start to show you how this works out in real science communication and, and the importance of these ghosts and these, these inner laboratory things for a real case of science communication. I'm going to drink some Red Bull and think of any, we'll start, we'll start in five minutes and, and we'll start if you have any questions or comments about what has happened so far. Okay. Okay, thank you. See you in five minutes.
Hey, there's somebody here from the ELA beam lines. I was talking about the laser system and they're, they're Roman, I can see somebody there. I picked a text about the beam lines for an example earlier. Anyway. There, there, there was a colleague sitting behind me from LA beam lines, but she okay. had to leave now. So she, okay, she was looking at the extract that you showed before and she mm -hmm. found it on the website. So she was looking at it and analyzing it and discussing it a little bit uh, here with me. <laughs> and there's also somebody named Roman, Roman? Yes. Who's also from the ELA beam lines, according to his title. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yes. Yes, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's basically the whole building. So okay. it's not a okay. department. It's a, it's another building called LED Lines. Who, okay, okay. So. Yeah, those those things are very large. Beam lines, yes. Okay. I, I don't know if it's been five minutes yet or not. I think so. Okay, um, anybody have any questions before we go on? Well, I just uh, have um, one comment. Uh, yesterday when I was in a mentoring meeting with, with a colleague, uh, she, she's a scientist, but uh, from a slightly different field. Uh, she's also doing physics, but some other type of physics. And I had um, a tough time explaining uh, what I'm doing actually, uh, because mm -hmm. it's both uh, both of us uh, do physics, but uh, yeah, slightly, slightly different. And uh, the uh, uh, science or the, the branches of science are so specialized nowadays that it's hard to communicate even among scientists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and all you need to do is integrate a new a new technology, an engineer or a, tech, a, a computer scientist in whatever project you're working on. And suddenly, all kinds of things happen. I mean, that's that's a standard problem in biology now, and and it I think it's a, just another reason to really make some effort to to solve this problem. Uh, so I think I think it, it it disrupts, you know. And and the question is always, where is the problem? So if you if you really need to explain your your research to somebody, it breaks down at some point, and and what basically one thing that we need to do is we need to develop a set of tools to figure out where those breakdowns happen and how to solve them. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take us through an example of a real case now where exactly that happens. And it's it's not the case where I'm speaking yet to another scientist. Um, but again, it's it's kind of good that I'm using biology examples because immediately you see the problems if we're sticking in physics, they're still there, or within a, even within a very specialized field, they're still there, but they're a little bit harder to see because a lot of times people think they're talking about the same thing. They think they have operating from the same structure and they're really not. And that makes things kind of complicated, especially if you don't pay any attention to the fact that it's there and how it's organized. So let me show you this example that I use all the time, which is a press release from my biology institute. And I just, so when you see one of these things, you have two choices and, and, and it's always a mixture of both. The first is you're trying to map a piece of information onto a structure that you already have. And if it's in your field, you're lucky because you already have a structure and all the little pieces, you have a place for them. If you don't have, if you're not from that field or if you don't have that structure, the text needs to help you try to build it. And the reason is, what are we trying to achieve at the end? So I don't expect when I give a talk or when I even when somebody reads something that I've written, I don't expect them to be able to reproduce any sentence. I, I don't expect them to memorize anything. 
I want them to understand what it means. And because if they understand what it means, then they can say it any way they want. And it'll be, if, if they really understood the meaning of it, they can say it any way they like, and it'll, it'll be correct. So one way to think about this is if you give a talk and everyone leaves the room, imagine there's somebody after, after the talk, everybody leaves the room and there's somebody standing at the door, standing outside and they say, what did the guy talk about? And everyone who comes out has to give an answer and you hope that the answer is pretty similar between all the people who come out. And you also hope that the answer is something that the speaker would agree with. And there's lots and lots of things that you can do in a talk or in a, a text to make sure that that happens, that, that the people who read it can go away. The first thing is, is you have to think, what's the main thing that I wanna communicate? The second thing is you have to think, okay, well, what do they have in their heads that I can use to, to, to help get the message across? And the third thing is just to plan for it. So one thing you could do is at the end of the talk, you could say, imagine that when you leave this room, there's somebody standing outside and they want to know what I talked about. Well, here's what you should tell them. Just give it to them. Anyway, let's look at this case, this real case, and I'll take you through all the steps. So the first is, as you read it, pay attention to how you're trying to process that information. Um, so this was from a real press release, a bad one, I think. Anyway, but we'll see. It was called Rewrite the Textbook's Transcription is Bidirectional. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start sites of transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. Now, if you have in your head a map like this, which is what I have in my head, more or less, then every little piece that is in that story, those are the things that are in orange. I know where to put them in that map. And I just, and I can understand the story because I already have the map that I need. And so I just take those pieces of information and I put them into the structure and then I can understand the story. If you don't have that map, you need to build it as you're going along. And let's just see how that works. Okay, so first of all, I don't know what the title means yet, but let's, let's just go to the first sentence. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. How do we connect the information in those two sentences to each other? How, how, are, those, how are those two facts connected to each other? Well, it's not easy to figure out just looking at the text. There's not really anything in those two sentences that shows you how to do it. You have to know something. I mean, maybe you know that genes and DNA are, genes are made of DNA, that would help. But, but there's a piece of information missing to show how those two things are connected to each other. And any biologist can tell you what that piece of information, missing information. The, the thing that's cool about this whole idea of ghosts is that if something's missing, I can tell you what it is. And I could even do it with physics, but we'll start with the simple stuff. We'll start with the biology, okay? So, so what's missing here is in biology, there's a very classical model called DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And it helps to know what transcription is. And anyway, if you just keep going and you just ask yourself, what connects those two pieces of information and what map am I drawing in my head? What you find out is that it's not very helpful because if you have to build it based on just what's in the text, then we have genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Well, okay, so we learned that genes encode proteins and they're a small part of the genome. And then later we're gonna find that most of that's transcribed into RNA and 
the rest we don't know. Then you learn a separate fact, which is that yeast generates transcripts that have functions. And then you learn another fact that promoters are the start sites of transcription, but, but the text doesn't link any of those things. You have to do all of that work yourself. You have to either know something or you have to do all that work yourself in your own head. And that means you have to figure it out. And you could figure it out if you maybe looked at this and saw, okay, well, this what's transcribed? So most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. Well, what's a transcript? <laughs> well, maybe something that's transcribed is a transcript. So maybe a transcript is RNA. Again, it's like a puzzle you have to figure out. And maybe you could, but it's an awful lot of work. And usually by this time, the person that this text is written for, which is the average newspaper reader, will have said, this is too hard, or those are interesting facts, but I don't know what to do with them. So, okay. So here too, we can ask ourselves, what's the solution? And the solution is certainly not to try to teach everyone this because there's no way to do it. Maybe if we had a month or a long text or whatever, I could give them parts of this. But so this is what's in my head again. And all I did was I sat down and I asked, okay, so what's connected to what? What does what? What's the relationships between these things? That's not a good solution. So what are we going to do? What is the solution? Well, let me just first figure out what's, what the information is in the story, what story is telling, what the structure of that information is. And when I do that, so if, if I want people to understand what this means, then the first thing is I have to see what's in my inner laboratory. I have to see that structure. I need to maybe like make a map of it or I need to like write it down in a very small number or draw it or something. And, and then I need to figure out what's, how can I get that information across with the least number of steps or the least number of parts? And then I have to think, okay, they don't know anything about genes and DNA and transcription, but maybe they know something similar because, you know, in my head, I'm thinking of genes, DNA, and transcription. But as we saw before, when we were talking about molecules, I'm not really thinking of the molecule. I have a pattern or a concept. And so I also have a pattern or a concept here. And what is that pattern like? Well, if I draw it, I get this. So I just need to know a few things. I know that I need to know that cells have this thing called the transcription machinery. And that machine is a little machine. And what it does is it binds to DNA. It reads the DNA and it writes information into an RNA molecule that goes off and makes proteins. And people used to think that when that machine binds to the DNA and it reads and it writes, it could only do that in one direction. But what they found in this study was it could do it in two directions, which is really interesting for all kinds of reasons. Okay, so this is the, all I need to do is give people this amount of information. And the stuff in white isn't really necessary. It's here's the main part. They have a transcription machinery. It reads DNA. It makes RNA. And we used to think that it did that only in one direction. Now we know it does it in two. And I'm going to tell you about that because it's really interesting for lots of reasons. Okay, that's the pattern. So if you look carefully at this pattern, there's a secret structure to it. And the secret structure has to do with a metaphor. A lot of times we think in metaphors. So the pattern that you have for thinking of what a crystal is like is a kind of a structure image in your head, which is like a crystal, but it's also like other things, maybe like a shelf or like a, 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 a mesh or something. Anyway, here the pattern is reading. So we have a machine that finds a place in DNA it reads the place in DNA and it writes something. So it's reading and writing. The machine goes onto the DNA, it reads the DNA and it writes something like a text. So that's a metaphor. And now we can use, now all I need to do is to, to try to give people that pattern by using things that they know and are familiar with. So here's, 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 here's a possible solution. The first thing I've done is I've changed the title. I've made it into something that gets the point across without adding any weird terms like transcription or whatever, okay? So our DNA can be read backwards and forwards. And then, then I need to engage people. So I need, to, I need to get them interested in the story. I need to link it to something they know or 
at least I need to tell them what part of the universe it's in, what part of their apartment it's in, basically. So I'm going to talk about cells. Our cells and, and why this is important. Oh, remember we earlier we talked about usually before you tell a person a fact, you, you tell them kind of why it's interesting or why they should know that fact or why it's important. Well, let's do that. So our cells specialize and cope with the challenges of life by producing different sets of molecules. They do this by drawing on different recipes in their DNA that they use to build RNAs and then proteins. This process begins when a cellular machine scans DNA, locates the instructions it needs for a particular molecule. The machine attaches itself at the beginning of the code, reads it, and transcribes it letter by letter into an RNA molecule. Until now, scientists have thought that the recipes only made sense when read and transcribed in one direction like this text. But scientists at EMBL have now found that when it binds, the machine can often read and transcribe in both directions. The team discovered, so I've told the whole story. I've used patterns that they know, machine, recipe, uh, reading, writing, transcribing. And, and when I tell the story this way, first of all, I, there's, I think there's a greater chance, a lot greater chance that people will be able to repeat it in a logical way in different words because they will remember things like the metaphor, the recipe. And I think also usually what happens is people ask a really smart question at this point when they read that. They ask a really smart question. If I had a machine and I told you suddenly, I have a machine that can read backwards and forwards. Well, one thing you want to know is how does a machine know which direction it should read? And that's a really smart scientific question. And interestingly enough, you don't need to know any science to ask a really smart scientific question because you got the pattern, you understood the pattern. And the second thing is they understand that there's implications to this. So this means potentially the big recipe book in our cells has twice as many recipes in it. And that's important because people don't have as many genes as we used to think they did. And so how do we, how do we, how much information does it take to build a human being? Well, we don't know, but there's a lot more there than we thought. So I've done many things. I've, I've engaged people by, by linking it to something relevant or interesting or tried to get them into the story by linking it to them. Um, I've used familiar patterns that, again, I, when I think of transcription in a cell, I know that it's not really reading and writing. But again, my image in my inner laboratory is not the real thing either any more than a molecule is the real thing. It's a concept and it's a pattern. And I just need to map those patterns onto each other. And I learned about transcription and about DNA and RNA by using patterns exactly like this. And the next thing is, is I've told the real story. So I've told actually what they found. And I've also opened up the chance now to discuss what the meaning of it is, what the implications of it are. What, why is it useful to know this? Or what, what will it change to know this? So that process, so, so we, we've talked about this now. I've taken the story, I've analyzed it. I've, I've found the problems which had to do with ghosts. I mapped out the structure that I was trying to give people to understand. And I use that to make a new text that tries to do these things. So there's one more step to take, and that is to say, why is that at all useful for research? So I, I told you at the very beginning, if, if we learn to communicate better, we become better scientists. Okay, well, we've gone through a lot of steps here. And the question is, what does any of that have to do with science? And I'm going to show you two, two ways that those things are connected to each other. The first is... I have understood that when I think of transcription and DNA and RNA and the transcription machinery, I'm using the metaphor of reading and writing. It's a pattern in my head that I use. So what else do I do when I read and write? Well, when I read, first of all, I like to have alcohol there if possible, but not anymore, but I used to like to have alcohol there. We won't talk about that, but, but when I read, so if I get to something that's really boring, a lot of times I skip over it. Like in a paper, it's the materials and methods. I don't care what machine and what protocol they use. I'm sorry, it's just a personal failure of mine. But so, so I just skip stuff. Or 
if I misunderstand something, I go back and reread it and try to figure it out. Or if I see a passage that I think is important, I might underline it, or I can take notes for later, or I can stop to take a phone call and then come back. I can mark my page. I can reread a few pages. I can look something up. Does a biological machine do any of those things? Does a transcription machinery ever skip boring passages? It does, actually. Does a biological machine go back and reread? I don't know. What would that, what would the equivalent be for this machine? Um, does it underline an important passage? Well, what would the biological equivalent of that be? That would be you, you emphasize something and you maybe come back and look at it again later. Well, that's interesting because when a gene gets transcribed, every time it makes it more likely that it will be transcribed again. So there is kind of a biological horror. And, and again, do I, what happens if I get interrupted? If, I, if, a, if a signal comes in, if I get interrupted, do I ever stop, pause? And then again, I don't know. And, and when, when we do this exercise, probably 80 or 90% of the questions we ask will be silly, but there'll be that one <laughs> that is really interesting and the only reason you thought of asking that question is because you understood the pattern in your head. So you, you realized, I'm thinking of read this like reading. So, okay, so that's one thing that you can do. That's one way that this kind of thinking about communication can help with your science. Because if, if you see how your brain has put together the, the model that you have of that system in your inner laboratory, then you can play sort of chess games with it that you couldn't play if you didn't see how that model was put together. If you didn't see the parts, you didn't understand the rules. So, and, and we only do that because we had this problem of communication. So communication forced us to analyze, we needed to write about it. So it forced me to go into that laboratory and say, okay, so how do I really think about that? And what are the parts? And okay, so that's the first thing. The next thing is, um, We'll go back to our favorite molecule, beta catenin. And I'm gonna tell you a little story of a scientist that I was working with who was working on this molecule. And his job was to explain his dissertation to his grandparents, okay? And his grandparents were not biologists or not scientists. They were people like you and me who don't know any of this stuff. So how did, how did we solve that problem and how we approach the task? The very first thing that we did was I told him, I want you to tell me very clearly, and it's fine, you can be as technical as you like. I want you to tell me what it is you're actually trying to find out. And so he said, okay, here's what I'm doing. I'm gonna show you a chart. And this chart is really, really important for all kinds of reasons. So he, he was asking himself the following question. He said, this molecule called beta catenin, it, is a protein and its function happens because it is able to bind onto other molecules in different conformations, in different times, in different contexts. And when it does that, it's one of these things we call a transcription factory. It goes into the nucleus of a cell and it binds to DNA and it picks out DNA sequences and reads them and transcribes them. And so, in diseases and in all kinds of situations, the output of the system is different. Different genes get activated, and that's because it binds to different partners at different times for different reasons. So his thesis was this really technical thing. He was trying to figure out what is the structure of this molecule? What's its chemistry and its shape that permits it to bind to certain partners at certain times and that changes its shape and allows it to bind to different regions of DNA. And that causes it to activate different sets of genes. I, I hope that's it's as clear as I can make it given the time that I have. But we'll get back, we'll come back to it, okay? So this is a really specific, specific topic. It's, it's so specific that when you do your dissertation, you're supposed to find one that nobody else is working on. So, so we start by getting him to tell me exactly what he's doing. And then I say, okay, now we're gonna look at why you're doing that, why it's interesting. And, and we're also gonna look at this very specific question as an example of more general questions. Okay, so we have a more general question, which is, um, 
we're looking at the behavior of this molecule, which is something called the transcription factor. And the reason we're interested in that is because we're really interested in knowing why cells activate different sets of genes at different times. So for example, when they specialize, when, when a, a, a sort of stem cell becomes a specialized cell, it needs different genes. When it adapts because it's stressed or when there's some kind of change in the environment, it needs different genes. And during diseases, sometimes it activates the wrong sets of genes. And all these things are managed a lot by these things called transcription factors. And so if we just take one of these, specialization is how very different cell types come from one single cell, which we all start as. Why have we done this? There's 25 reasons to do this. The first reason is, because as a, let's look at the scientific reasons. The, the reason, and, and I told you at the beginning, I think there's a connection between doing great science like Nobel Prize winning science and good communication. And this is one of the connections. And that is usually when you look at what people won Nobel Prizes for, it's stuff like this. It's some little detailed nitpicky, tiny little thing. But it's also part of this big, hierarchy of other things, it's somehow connected to this basic issue of how a single cell produces different type of cells. And, and usually they found exactly the right question to answer one of these much bigger questions. So as you're learning something about this one molecule, you're also learning something about transcription factors in general and how cells adapt and how they specialize and all these different things. So, so scientifically, it's important to see that connection because you're not only working on this, but in fact, you're working on all these problems at the same time. How, how do single cells become different types of cells? And if you see that connection, you may realize you've discovered something really fundamental about some other bigger level of science. The other reason that this is interesting is because when you go to write your results and discussion of what you learned, you say, yes, well, I learned something about this one transcription factor. But I may have also learned something more general about which genes are activated, or I may have learned something special about this one situation and disease. It, it helps us explain this bigger problem. So that's important for science. The other thing that this chart does, which is really cool, is it gave him a way to talk to his grandparents about his science. Because his grandparents have never heard of a transcription factor before, and they've certainly never heard of beta catenin before. But his grandparents do know that we all come from a single cell. And so what he did was he just used this as a path to get to his discussion. He said, Grandma, you know that when, we, when babies start to grow, they start from this single cell in your body and they grow and grow and grow. And that single cell, which is just kind of round and boring looking, becomes all these really wildly different types of cells like red blood cells. They look like a donut. And a nerve cell, it looks like a big tree with branches and roots. And, and have you ever wondered how that one cell can then become all those different types? It divides and each time it divides, it becomes a little different. And so it produces these, it produces nerve cells. Well, it does that because that one cell at the beginning it has the recipes for all the types of cells you ever need in your whole life in your body. And each type of cell just uses different recipes to produce different stuff. And then it gives them a different shape and then they behave differently and they do different tasks in your body like nerve cells help you think and, and so on and so on. Except Uncle Bob, he, he can't use his anymore. He drank too much beer or whatever. Anyway, never mind. So, so, um, um, so what I'm working on is I'm trying to figure out what reads that recipe book and, and what know, how it knows when to read a recipe and use it and when not to read a recipe and use it. And it does that because it gets little helpers involved. So I'm look, working on a molecule and it works with other molecules that help it decide. And I'm looking at the chemistry of that and I'm looking at these molecules have different shapes. I'm looking at how they're sort of, how they're able to attach themselves to each other and how they're able to make those decisions activate different genes. That path, all we did was we started here and we went step by step down into here. And now he's told his grandmother exactly what it is he's doing. I mean, he hasn't told her the names of things, doesn't matter, but she understands the point now. And so 
so this chart, this kind of chart has all kinds of different functions. It, it links what you're doing in science to, to how you can communicate with different types of people. Now, if, if, if the student goes off to a conference and he's gonna give this talk, he's not gonna start by talking about, you all know, all of you great molecular biologists out there, you all know that we start as a single cell. Of course not, because they all know that. And he knows it. But, and they, they all know a lot of this stuff, but they may, and they probably will know what a transcription factor is, but they won't maybe know anything about this one particular one. So you go to the conference and you could say, we all know how fundamental a gene activation is to so many biological processes. And we all know that these very powerful transcription factors, um, there's a real issue in science about how they achieve their specificity. He would, he would just put this, he would, he would just start at a different place start a little bit higher to get to his point and to get to his study, and then go back out when he needs to for the discussion. So this is the plan. This is the plan that, that it, it, it helps in so many ways. It helps in so many ways to see the structure of these ideas, to see what's actually in your head and how you think about these things. And now if we go back and we take any of those texts, we can do the same thing with that we did with this press release, we can do the same thing with any of those other texts. Um, I, I collected a bunch of texts from the FZU. And, and the third part now, we'll talk about your work. We can either do it as an interview like this, because there's so few of us, we could talk about your science, and we could try to build this kind of tree. Um, or we can look at those, those texts that I collected, either one. Let me just quickly put this together and summarize before we do that. And, and so again, what I want you to remember from this is that I've tried to show you how we can use communication as a tool. What we've done is we've exposed these ghosts and these kind of hidden patterns and these structures that you have in this inner laboratory that you've built. I've used the example biologists in the next part, we'll go into your own and look at that. Um, the goal, the, the purpose of science communication is as kind of a game board, which we use to, to discuss models and applications to systems. We're not just delivering facts. If you want to communicate the meaning of a scientific question or data, you have to, you have to relate it to this structure of scientific concepts and models that we just so often forget to mention and talk about their ghosts in the background. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get the audience to build this, these little structures in their head. And I told you right at the beginning today, what I wanted to try to help you to do was to build a structure in your head for, to see how these things are communicated with each other. You need to do this to understand ghosts and these ghosts are these hidden patterns that connect information and give it meaning. Um, if, if these ghosts remain invisible, they have all kinds of chaotic effects on thinking and communication. And they also affect, if you don't see that you're thinking of these patterns about the system you're working on, it also affects your research because, because you don't see that structure. There's a thought process behind it or a logic behind it that you haven't exposed. And that can, of course, shift the way that you see the system. Um, if you wanna expose these ghosts, the very best way is to talk to different audiences because you have to use different metaphors and patterns to try to approach the same systems and the, the science that you're using. So that's <laughs> what we've talked about now. <laughs> and that's kind of what I hope you see, how I, I hope you see this connected to each other. And in the next part, we'll try to apply this to what you're doing and, and to some of the stuff at the Institute. But before we do that, I need to take, my throat is kind of dry. Are there other questions or comments so far? No one's died yet, as far as I can tell. I mean, there are some of the screens. I hope are blocked. not. No comments from my side. Everything is very nicely prepared and explained. Okay, well, let me, let's, let's then, let's take a volunteer now. Who'd like to volunteer? I'm going to just ask you a few questions about your science, and we're going to try to put some of this together for you. Anybody? Cool. 
come on, don't be shy. I'll stop, I'll stop recording now, I promise. Maybe it's interesting, but I'll stop. Hang on just a second. I first have to stop sharing and now I can stop recording.